Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Tradesman Talks, where we talk about ways that you can improve your existing home service business or even take the leap and bet on yourself with building your own home service business. Today, specifically, we're going to talk about why some contractors get a really bad name. Um, depending on how old you are or what you've done with with uh, life circumstances, you may have found yourself hiring a contractor. And maybe that experience was less than ideal. Uh, or possibly you've heard of other people's experiences with contractors that were less than ideal. And a lot of these negative experiences often stem from very similar problems. And so we're going to dive a little bit into why some contractors get a bad name and things that you can do to avoid building a negative reputation. And if you can proactively address some of these concerns, you can find yourself building a good reputation very quickly. Because when a lot of people in your market are pretty bad, it doesn't take a lot to become a lot better. And so uh, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit. But first, uh, Wilson, how was your week? <laughs> the, the week is good, man. Um, we've got some some new tests that we're doing that are they're working out really well. So we're excited about that. Um, you know, some of our coaching clients, we've had some, uh, a few that are taking just massive action, seeing a ton of results and it's fun, man. When people are doing the the steps and implementing the exact tools and tips that we give them. And all of a sudden they're like, they call us and like, Holy crap, it's working. It's like, yeah, I know. Isn't it fun? And so, uh, <laughs> really cool week. Cause we've just seen some, some big wins and that was super exciting. Nice. How about you, man? Week's going well. Um, the investment properties are making progress um, over there. And then I'm actually in Orlando this week, jumping in the operations a little bit to uh, get some extra things done. And so it's been a, a good reminder of certain things within the process and being kind of in the business a little bit more than usual mm. gives you a, or gave me a, a reminder on some things, a, a fresh perspective on others and um, some lessons. And it kind of translates a little bit into our topic today. I, I kind of saw some things this week that sparked some thoughts that really brought me back to when I first started the business and how I was observing the rest of the market and what other home service providers were doing. And with us being in cabinet refinishing, I naturally was um, comparing cabinet refinishers first and you saw a lot of room for improvement i i used to work for another company um what eight nine eight years ago nine years ago and i was seeing a lot of areas of improvement but i wasn't able to really get direct comparisons to other home service providers and as i've seen some over the years there's a lot of patterns there's some trends that pop up with things that can create a less than ideal experience for the customer. And then having owned my own business in this industry for about seven years, we have unfortunately contributed to less than ideal situations. Sometimes me being the owner, though, I don't do everything. I'm ultimately responsible for everything. Right. So if one of my technicians is providing less than an ideal experience, you know, it's worth investigating. We need to figure out how to, resolve the issue, how to prevent it from happening. And it may result in that technician not actually being a good fit. And though that's been the case throughout the years, there are certain things that come up that can be easy to slip or it can be easy to allow to happen um, that provide a less than ideal experience for these customers. And one of the major things is setting expectations. Um, most people really appreciate honesty and even if it's not exactly what they wanted to hear they will respect you if they feel that you are being genuine and sincere and honest yep. and when it is applied to home services a big expectation that home homeowners have is around the timeline and We've learned this the hard way a long time ago. We actually emphasize now that we do not promise or guarantee timelines. Right. Though we have expectations and we have 
a plan Mo and we, we can say that most jobs get done during you know a week with our service we never want to guarantee or promise a completion date because things come up that might require additional time we might have to redo things or the homeowner uh, makes some changes to the scope of work and, and so forth working but, around other contractors <laughs> Right. And so you want to be sure to set those expectations, because if if you just go into that home and you essentially say yes to everything and you more or less say what they want to hear, which I know happens a lot, a lot of contractors or salespeople of contracting businesses will go into these houses and they will try to say whatever they can to create a connection, to get agreement, to get compliance with the homeowner, uh, and ultimately to get the job. And sometimes those expectations aren't translated to the technicians doing the work. Right. And I could even say with these investment properties that we're working on, uh, I'm having to hire contractors quite often. And I I would say even more than I would like to or have planned to because of what we're talking about, these home, these contractors will come in here and they will tell me whatever I want to hear so that they can get the project, so that they can get a check. Um, and everything doesn't always pan out the way that they, they um, project the plan to be. And it's not always the contractor's fault, but when it becomes clearly avoidable, it right. can get really frustrating for everyone involved. And so for that reason, I encourage everyone listening to not guarantee a timeline, but if your customer asks you a question, you want to make sure you answer with something that is transparent and sincere. You don't want to just blow smoke and you don't want to uh, set yourself up for failure. Right. And that can happen really easily even after the project has started. And that's where we have ran into issues as a company and where I hear frustrations from homeowners come from. It's if the project is taken a little bit longer for whatever reason, the homeowners naturally want an update. And if those updates are setting unrealistic expectations, it will create a much worse situation and it will only add fuel to the fire of frustration to these homeowners or your customers. If you're going to say, hey, you know, we're going to need two more days to finish this, but once you start working, it ends up taking you five or six more days. It creates a very frustrating situation for the homeowner and for the contractor now, because now the contractor is having to deal with the reaction of the homeowner right. or, or your customer, whoever that might be. You know, these people are going to be upset that you set false expectations and they're going to express that frustration. And most contractors react the same way they get frustrated that the homeowner's frustrated and so it ends up creating this snowball effect of negative feedback loop yeah and it's completely avoidable if that contractor instead of saying it was going to get done in two days said you know i'm not really sure when it's going to get done because of a b and c or if the the plan is clear you can give yourself some extra time to plan for the unplannables Yep. And instead of two days, say it will be done in four days. And if you finish early, that's something to celebrate. But if you finish late, it's going to be uh, shooting yourself in the foot, as they say. And so I really encourage people to calibrate their expectations by really thinking things through. And then if something does come up and you have to set new expectations, to have the same mode of thinking and to be even more conservative, because if you're having to set new expectations, it's because things didn't go to plan. And so that should be a clear reminder that you should be a little bit more conservative when you're communicating these new plans yep. because they as well may not go to plan. Well, I think being conservative on, uh, I guess, any part of the conversation is probably incredibly important because right. when you, when you see the same behaviors repeating themselves again and again and again you start to wonder okay well there has to be a reason people would shoot themselves in the foot like that right 
it's a secondary gain. So it's like, if, if you're a contractor, you're talking to this homeowner, you're like, well, I really need this job. So you set unrealistic expectations. Maybe you get the job, but then that customer's pissed. They don't want to refer you. They don't ever want to work with you again. And more importantly, these days, people are five times at least more likely to leave you a bad review than they are to leave you a good review, right? Yeah. Like when people are upset, they scream it from the mountaintops. When people are thrilled, they they might tell you if you ask. And so it's it's oh, it's a short term decision that might have a positive short term because you have a little cash in your pocket. But the long term ramifications really aren't there. Yeah, and it's so not a valuable trade off. It's not. But I, I think a reason a lot of contractors do that is because they feel that they need the business. And the irony is. They wouldn't need business all the time if they would stop approaching business that way. And so right. they, they've created a, an environment that literally causes them problems and keeps them trapped in that environment, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you don't know to look at that behavior and stop it, you just think that's the way it is. I hear contracts sometimes say things like, well, you know, you know, when you're doing jobs like this, it's normal things go wrong. That's just part of the process. It's like, yeah, so why didn't you tell the customer that before you told him it would be done on Friday? You could just said, hey, we'd like to be done on Friday, but things happen, so we won't guarantee anything before the following Friday, <laughs> which uh, it, it, makes a lot, it makes a lot more sense, makes it easier. And one of the things that's nice about expectations is as a contractor, and Stephen, you probably have a lot more experience with, with this than, than most homeowners, right? You've done a lot of work. You've fixed a lot of things, so you have an idea about what something should take. You know, if a guy tells you something's going to take six weeks when you know it should take two, that might set off an alarm in your head. But most homeowners have no idea. Whatever you, the contractor, tells them will probably be what they, they take at face value most of the time. And so it's advantageous to say whatever your worst case scenario is, make that your baseline. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. And also remember that homeowners often will recall what they want to they yeah. will remember what they want to hear um and meaning if they're frustrated down the road during your project they're going to bring up things that will justify those emotions and they will sometimes even make up things or they will believe they, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes it's genuine they truly believe what they are saying is is true even though it may not be and, you know, they'll say, oh, the salesperson told me this or the technician told me that or you told me this. And if you're relying on memory or interpretation, that, too, can be a uh, recipe for disaster. And so as you're setting these expectations, it's certainly good to have these conversations with the homeowner and to also put it on paper and yep. have it a part of the agreement that they sign. Because. Though they may not read the whole agreement and they may not accurately remember the conversations you've had, having that piece of paper that points to you telling them something or you setting expectations, it can sometimes be enough to uh, ring a bell for the homeowner. Uh, and it also can certainly be of assistance if you do have to escalate the situation for for any reason, like if they start to refuse payment or over something. Yep. And, and if you can provide some protections within the, the actual agreement, that's going to be worth your while. So all these expectations that you guys want to set for these customers have in paper as well, but also incorporate some of the more important things in the conversation. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I mean, there, there's something to be said. I think it's natural human behavior. Um, there, there's a concept we like to refer to. Yeah, you know, it's keeping honest people honest. Yeah. And so, you know, if something somebody says something happened, you're like, oh, well, that's okay. There's a camera right there. We can see exactly what happened. People are like, oh no, just kidding. It's not a big deal. Right. It's weird how that works, and and contracts help a ton with that. You know, I was, I was like, I always like to think of things in structures, and so it's like if. If you were to categorize the four reasons that people dislike contractors, it all comes down to the experience that they have with them, but there are four things that make it. So it's going to be communication, craftsmanship, illegal activity, or acts of God. The only reason you'd have a bad experience with a contractor is going to be one of those four things. And for the most part, acts of God aren't in your control, right? Like, uh, you know, great example when uh, the electrical outlet fired and that house caught on fire, right? Yeah. 
you know, objectively, those homeowners could have been really pissed and, and they don't know, they're not electricians, they don't know why it happened, they could put the blame on you like that's not your fault as a contractor, maybe you get a one star review. Now, in y'all's case, you know, Felix saved their lives. So I think he deserved five stars, but, <laughs> you know, you can see that happening. The second thing is illegal activity. And unfortunately, that's something we as individual contractors can't stop other contractors from doing. There are fly by night guys out there, uh, like, for example, the guy that fixed our plumbing by wrapping a rag around it. You know, I don't know that that's. I think it's illegal. <laughs> you know, we contracted from work. He didn't do what he said. Did he code. lied about it? Yeah, that's not up to code. Like, in a situation like that, it's like, okay, cool. That should be a no-brainer. We should never have to talk about that. Craftsmanship. If you do a crappy job, um, you know, I would blame homeowners and contractors equally for that because there are literally homeowners that, yeah, you know, like if you get a quote and it's thirty percent of every other quote that you got, and then your job looks like crap, like. I mean, come on, dude. If you spent a thousand dollars on a car and it won't start, are you surprised? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, uh, a lot of that, all of that stuff, should be no-brainers. But almost every example I think we'll talk about today, for the most part, is going to fall under the fourth category, which is communication. Yeah. Right. Don't set expectations on timeline, or promise something's going to be done and it's not, or say they're going to use particular materials and they don't, or there's a problem that pops up and they don't they don't talk about it. Like the number one challenge that I think most contractors have is they're poor communicators. Yeah, and as I think about this out loud, I I can see how fear itself really plays a factor in some of these avoidances mm -hmm. i think the experience of not setting expectations not properly communicating a lot of it can stem from fear in the contractor where they may have a a fear of conflict and they don't want to um you know argue or be condemned by the homeowner and and some of these people they they may not want to well, that probably stems, you know, the conflict thing, because I, I was saying, I was thinking uh, they may not like to negotiate at certain points. They may not want to be rejected. Um, they don't want to, they would rather deal with the punishment than the discomfort of being proactive. Um, you know, it's almost like kids and their parents, like some kids do stupid things and it's not like they don't realize it's stupid or they'll get in trouble trouble it's just sometimes easier to sit there and listen to them yell at you mm -hmm. than it is to not get what you want or to not do what you want or in other words to do what's more comfortable in the moment well you know? dude a, a kind of interesting point related to that is one of the things that we're, we're comparing right is it's current discomfort against potential future discomfort right and so it's like if I know something's going to be uncomfortable right now, and I'm comparing that with a chance that something else might be uncomfortable in the future, a lot of times we as humans discount that future chance as being smaller than it really is. Uh, one of my, my favorite memes is there's a little, it's like, a, I don't know, it's a bird or something. And it says, I took a calculated risk. Unfortunately, I'm very bad at math. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I think for most people, that avoidance behavior is the manifestation of that exact decision making. It's like, well, yeah, if I don't call them, they might get pissed off later. But if I call them, they're definitely going to be pissed off now. Right. And it's like, yeah. yeah, but the level of pissed off, you can't, you know, it's like, if I don't call them, they're going to be extremely pissed off later. And if I call them, they're going to be mildly frustrated right now. And so when you use proper language, like mildly frustrated, it's way better than extremely pissed. Yeah. And so I, I think for, for a lot of people, it's, it's recognizing like short-term discomfort a lot of times is going to be the right, like where you feel the resistance is probably where you should be going. If you're like, oh, I don't want to call this homeowner and tell them that we screwed up, you should probably call them and tell them you screwed up. It will always pan out better, especially if the week isn't over. Yep. You know, for some of these projects that take multiple days or even a whole week, you know, if you still have time left on the schedule, you know, be proactive with the communication. Don't wait till at the end to say, oh, yeah, this is why it was delayed and try to justify the delay as if, you know, it wasn't in your control or 
how it wasn't your fault. Well, that may be true, but so is your ability to communicate before the originally expected deadline. Right. You you, you had an idea that things were going to require some more time well before the completion date that you had set, you know, um, especially if it's delayed. So communication is a huge one. Setting expectations and properly communicating these expectations and even updating those expectations um, whenever necessary yep. is always a good thing. I, I tell contractors to over communicate. It is better to have a homeowner think you are too much yep. than the opposite, you, meaning after you have a conversation with them, follow up with the text, you know, so you have a paper trail not only for yourself to remember what the conversation was about, but for them to also remember. Yep. Boring uh, and annoying is better than likely incompetent. Yeah. Yeah. Calling them every day to let them know what you completed that day. You know, for some homeowners might be annoying, for others might be highly appreciated. Right. And when they are talking to you about or talking to other homeowners about you and they are telling them, hey, yeah, you know, John, he came over to work on our plumbing and he updated me every hour. And I was I was in the room next door and every hour he was letting me know how much he had left to do, what he completed. And it was it was kind of over the top. Um, a homeowner who is wanting to hire someone in that that field, they're not going to degrade you because you were over communicating. Right. You know. Because they will discount how annoying that is. They will overvalue how beneficial it is, and they'll discount how annoying it actually is. And so it's not like you literally have to update these people every hour, but at least every day. And if the homeowners aren't there, send them a quick text. Hey, here's a picture of what I, how far I got today. Here's my game plan for tomorrow. I hope to be at your house, you know, same time between 9 and 10. Hope that works. Let me know if you have any questions. And like just taking the few seconds to do that can create a completely different customer experience than if you, even if you didn't do anything wrong, if you just started the project and let's say it's a five day project, you start on Monday and you say absolutely nothing to the homeowner. And even though you see them, you, you say nothing and you just finish the job and, and Friday you tell them you're done. That lack of communication could be compared to someone who does communicate regularly and the person who's communicating regularly will get chosen with everything else equal. Yep. You know, it's that communication allows them to feel like they are in the loop. They know what's going on. They have a false sense of control, but at least feels like it's con they're in control, you know, with what's going on in the project. And so catering to those things can dramatically influence what these homeowners think about you. And it will dramatically improve your reputation. Well, and that, that's it. Every one of these things, it, it it makes it a better experience for the homeowner, right? But there are secondary and tertiary consequences that are positive that come from that. Like homeowners are more likely to want to refer you. If you're talking to them every day, there's a much greater chance you're going to form a positive relationship with them, which is going to make right. them want to refer you, even if, you know, just because they like you, which is something... Yeah that I think people discount, like, hey, I'm not a people person. Okay, well, if you're not a people person, you damn well better hire some because a business involves people, right? People buy your product. You can't not be a people person. Yeah. It's just, it's just not an option. Um, and, and sometimes I wonder, man, because it seems or it feels at times like if you went to Pizza Hut and you got the level of inconsistent service at Pizza Hut that you get with contractors or even just restaurants, right? If restaurants frequently went around and were as bad as contractors frequently go around are, like there would be mass hysteria, right? It just it it just doesn't it doesn't work in other industries. And so I always wonder, like, is it nature or nurture? Is there something inherently about contractors that they they don't care as much? Or is it the people that don't care as much get drawn to our industry because we've let it become acceptable? Yeah, I think it's both. A lot of contractors in recent past get into their trade outside of choice. You know, mm -hmm. They're not necessarily pursuing a career in the trades, right. though some are. And the ones who do aspire 
and do pursue a career in a specific specialty trade, those guys tend to do really well. You know, yeah. they have a level of care and they have a level of intention that typically provides a better career path yep. and a better customer experience. And it's funny how those two things go hand in hand. And if you can really focus on the customer experience and show how much you care, even as an employee, you're going to get shot up the ranks. And as a business owner, you're going to get plenty of reviews and you'll be able to grow your business off of referrals and your reputation and being able to provide that experience long enough in front of others on your team, you'll be able to lead and motivate that in that way and create a culture around these things. And ultimately, what should be done is a system of creating that experience and creating standard operating procedures that allow these other contractors in your business or other team members to provide that same level of experience even if they don't care about it as much as you do. Right. I mean, we all have heard the saying, you know, no one's going to care like the business owner. Well, unfortunately, that more often is true than not. Sure. And how can you create a successful business with that being true? And so that's where the standard operating procedures come from. That's where creating a good growth plan with your team and for the people within your business, that's uh, can help as well. But just having that that level of culture is hugely beneficial. Well, I, I think the, a lot of the business systems, standard operating procedures, the, uh, you know, step-by-step -step instructions for every single part of the business uh, can absolutely have that effect and can help a subpar contractor take things to the next level. But the, the first thing that has to happen is one, you have to recognize like as a contractor, are you currently doing everything that you could do to maximize your customer experience? Right? Like, or even even a better question, because maybe people go, I can't do everything. That's ridiculous. It's like, okay, cool. Call three of your competitors and have them come give you a quote and ask yourself, are you outperforming those guys by a pretty strong majority? Because if the answer is no, odds are you're not going to be super impressed. It's like um, <laughs> we had a, a guy, John, that came through our program two years ago, three years ago. And uh, I, I wanted to think that John signed up because, you know, I'm, I'm a really cool guy to talk to. Uh, but after like three weeks of putting me off, he called me up one day and goes, hey, Wilson, I've decided I'm going to do this. And I was like, oh, I thought I assumed you were gone because you didn't respond to anything I said. He's like, yeah, well, I was out getting some quotes and I called five guys. And of those five guys, only two got back to me. It took them an average of four days. And one of the guys never even came out for the quote. So one of two things are going on here. Either these guys are so busy that they don't care, which means there's a lot of food on this table, or these guys are so bad, there's no way I'm not going to blow them out of the water. Yeah. And he was doing 40K a month within like three months of starting his business. Yeah. Because he implemented systems. He followed a process. And it's, it's interesting because if you as a tradesperson come into an industry where the Average level of, of quality and, and not necessarily quality of work. I know a lot of contractors that do really great work. They just suck to work with, right? They're very good at what they do. Just homeowners don't like the experience of letting them do that. <laughs> if you can come in and you can provide that great experience, like a tradesperson that takes their business seriously makes more money than a doctor. Like if you're willing to hire a few guys and scale up, you can make more money than a doctor. That's a cool thing, but it requires like you take the same level of precision and the same level of dedication that a doctor took to get there, right? It's going to take that same level of effort. And that's the distinction here that, you know, we see this mix of intentions and motivations in this industry. Yep. You know, when you talk about doctors, there's a required process to, there's a, a required evolution for these people, these people have to dedicate a portion of their lives to becoming a doctor. With these tradespeople, they may be getting into it out of desperation because they can't afford their phone bill next month, and so they'll they'll pick up a part time job or a job at a construction site. They'll learn one of the trades, then they'll go work for a smaller outfit with the skill that they learned on the job site. 
but they carry a lot of their personal baggage and a lot of bad habits with them. And so they don't necessarily look at it strategically. They don't look at it as an opportunity. They just look at it as a source of a paycheck. And so right. they'll go from one job to the next and they don't realize that they're somewhat sabotaging themselves. So you see a lot of people, unfortunately, from that sort of behavior or that sort of thinking in the industry, I think over time, um, it's not going to be sufficient. You know, we have a lot more people in other generations going into the trades. And you know, one of our missions is really to expose these opportunities that exist in, to, in the trades. And I think out of there being more awareness of these opportunities, more and more people will choose that path and out of that choice they will evolve just like a a doctor may evolve through their process someone who's pursuing uh, a career in plumbing will go through an apprenticeship will learn and, and be interested and have a lot of care in what they're doing and therefore much more likely to be successful and so i think if you can you know us in particular trying to build this platform i think if we can help more people become educated and help people on the path of, of choosing these trades, you'll naturally get a, a much better type of contractor. And so, you know, I think that's, that's why a part of reason why contractors get a bad name is because they're, they don't even want to be a contractor, right? They're, they're, they're in out of desperation. And so they're just trying to collect a paycheck. They're not actually trying to, provide a good customer experience or provide even good quality work. They're just trying to stay busy for eight hours so they can, you know, collect their check or they're just trying to get by with good enough so that they can, you know, move on to the next one. Well, and, and that's a, that's an interesting thing because there is a, a huge distinction there. Like there are guys that are super talented uh, and they care. They just don't really know much about a business and, and maybe they aren't people. They aren't people persons which is a choice, right? And they could make that choice and change their behavior if they chose to. And then or at least be nice. You know, you don't have to be a super social person well, to yeah. provide a good customer experience. If you just are polite and maybe a little bit more professional in how you speak, you know, you don't have to have long conversations with these people. 100%. Yeah. And, and that's, well, that's why the people person thing, it, it's, it's just, it's a title label and an excuse. It's like, I'm not a people person. Like, well, dude, I'm introverted too. I don't want to spend all of my free time hanging out with strangers, uh, but if hanging out with that stranger is how I get paid, I'm going to do a good job when I'm there. Just like right. if I made sandwiches for a living, I'm going to make a damn good sandwich. It's a, it's a function of doing a good job at whatever it is that you're doing and zooming out and saying, as a contractor, my job is not just to fix this thing. My job is to fix this thing and create a good customer experience as part of the process. And if you can internalize that, it will make a big difference. But that is the most awesome thing about this opportunity because over the last you know, 10, 12 years, everybody's been told since they basically made college, uh, everybody could get a loan no matter what, regardless of how qualified they were. It's like, oh yeah, you have 1.2 GPA and a 500 SAT score. Here's a loan. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool, man. Uh, everybody got taught to go there. Like if I had told my parents I wanted to go to trade school, they would have flat out told me no. It okay. would have been their choice, but they would have fought me tooth and nail on that right. because college was the only way. And so because of that, there's a massive shortage and there's all these people out there that have useless degrees, right? Literally underwater basket weaving that are unhappy in their jobs that would have probably been very happy contractors. And that shortage of people has made it so guys can literally act and behave that poorly and still get by in this industry. There is no other industry that I'm aware of that has the types of shortages that we have. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, with society teaching our parents and generations before potentially um, that going into contracting was a bad move. Right. That understanding or belief has carried through with these people into adulthood. And so, unfortunately, some people look at contractors as beneath them. They right. look at contractors as unaccomplished. They look at contractors as wash ups or, or people that are, you know, that aren't very skilled. And that is unfortunate. That's not true at all. Right. You know? 
these these people in these trades are are very intelligent. They're very ambitious, and many of them are uh, in some ways much more successful than some of these homeowners that could be judging them. <laughs> I, I dude, I laugh all the time. So uh, we we have a, a family friend guy didn't go to college, and I th- I think he took a couple. He took a, he he got his MIG and TIG certification. He now welds on diesel, uh, like large diesel uh, trucks. Okay. He straight out of trade school was making like a hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year with no debt, and then you've got kids with a degree in ancient Russian literature with a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt, making twenty five thousand dollars a year, teaching other people about Russian literature. It's like, dude, who? How could you possibly look down? I, I mean, I don't know how you could look anywhere under the weight of that crushing debt. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and so it's a, it's a weird thing, but there's a, there's a stigma around it. And I tell people, it's like, you know, at a certain point, it's like, okay, there might be a stigma around contractors, but at the end of the day, I don't mind. Like, if you're like, Hey, let's not pay you $500,000 a year to go clean these toilets. I'll strap on some gloves right now. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't matter because it is a service and it's a high need service. And so I think if people start looking at it from a more pragmatic perspective, like, and is what I'm about to do going to serve me better in the long run? It would change a lot of the perspective on the trades. And that's something, you know, Mike Rose talks a lot about and try to bring some attention to. Right. Um, but there's a big cultural wave to kind of undo there because, yeah, people still think that. Like There is a big cultural wave, and I think you and I will, will help contribute to that. Um, until that happens, though, there's somewhat of an opportunity zone right now because it is very simple to build success in the trades. It's obviously hard work, but the equation is very simple and you don't even have to get the answers all right. You just have to be a little bit better than others in the industry, you know, and you, you want to select a trade that is a good product market fit, as they say, you know, something that's in demand and it requires a skill. But if you learn that skill and you take on that, that journey with pride, and good intentions, you very well could build a multi six or a multi seven figure business for yourself. That also is very simple to operate. Yep. Um, and so the the whole perspective needs to change with how people look at contractors. And I think that's slowly happening. Um, and once that does happen, you're going to have a lot of a lot more supply coming into the market and potentially not the same proportion of demand in or growing demand and so you know it may not be as good as it is now (laughs) in the future when people realize college isn't the answer to a high-paying job right people now are looking elsewhere i dude i'm curious to see i think that's going to be a 10-year trend i know that right now literally right now last month more people left the trades due to retirement then went into yep. the trades as the new career. So it's still trending in our favor. But you know, one thing's recognized is that means now's the time because whenever people start turning around, if you're already established, like if you're the 600 pound gorilla of your market, you're not going to have to worry about all these new guys that are coming up because you're already established. You already have a business. And so now, now is the time. Absolutely. And it takes a little bit of time to build that boat. And so I mean, now, we'll, we'll dude, that, for the, the, Aust- the Austin shop did over, th- I, I, I think it's on, it, I, I need to check the numbers. I think it did close to 250,000 in the first year. That's awesome. And there was, there was no experience. Uh, you know, Logan had never run a business before. Logan had never painted cabinets before. Um, and we have nothing but five star views. Like, it takes a while to get to a seven figure mark for sure. Like we have two guys that did it in under two years, but you know, to, to have a really good income, something that other people would be jealous of, right? How many like college graduates make over $150,000 a year? Bro. It can't, can't be more than 10%. Like it's, it's, it doesn't take that long if you have a system and that's, that's the crazy thing about it. You just have to be willing to work hard. You know, we joked about this last week. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a a weird thing where people are more interested in, in trying to work smart. Uh, but if you'll just work hard, there's plenty of opportunity to make a lot of money. And sometimes that would be the smart thing. Yeah, it's usually both. 
it's how it, learning how to direct your hard work and that's what is smart <laughs> yeah learning how to strategically direct that effort uh, rather than just you know working super hard without much purpose but it's always going to require hard work that's that's a given yeah well and, so, and, and maybe even separating that a little bit further like i mean like physically demanding work like the the willingness to say i will do physically demanding work to get paid a whole bunch more money is it's an easy and simple decision for anybody that's not afraid of a little bit of elbow grease yeah absolutely so i i hope that that helped give you guys some clarity and advice for the present or future you know whether you have already started a home service business and you're looking to improve it certainly speaking to some of the concerns that homeowners have or why some contractors might get a bad name and being proactive with some of those things learning how to effectively communicate with these customers how to properly set expectations how to provide a little bit more professionalism than other people in your market you know, these are are very low hanging fruit sort of things and as wilson pointed out if you're looking for ideas on how to improve the overall experience for your business, go ahead and check out your competitors. Book some appointments with other home service providers in your market for your own house or a friend's house and observe the experience that they provide and use that as some inspiration. You might get motivated because they're so bad and it's obvious on where you know you can add some improvements or they're so good and you get inspired on how to take your business to the next level. And so if you guys need any clarity on that or would like any guidance, regardless of what trade you're in, we'd be happy to help you. Feel free to send us an email at support at cabinetstartup.com. Regardless of what trade you're in, we could probably provide some guidance or clarity. And uh, until next week, I hope you guys have a great week. And we'll talk to you guys same place, same time next week. Bye, everybody.